as we get started, I'll just take a second to update us on shoe boxes. So shoe boxes, um, we had said that last year we did 24, I think it was, 22 or 24. We'd be need to kind of see if we could get to 40. So we're at 19, so we're almost halfway there, and we're still at Thanksgiving weekend, so we've got the better part of a month or a month to be able to do that. Um, so with the shoe boxes again, it's $25 if you want to sponsor one, and that takes care of the shipping and handling, and Deb does find stuff to put in the contents. If we get 40, um, it would be kind of cool maybe if we got together and some of us packed the shoe boxes, right? <laughs> it takes a lot of work to be able to get that. So Deb does the buy-in for that, but maybe we can get together and yeah. sort stuff and pack it. Mm -hmm. So I think right now most of us are fairly, well, maybe not overwhelmed, but we're certainly kind of wondering what's next in this crazy world. Um, I know I am. So today we're not actually going to talk about COVID-19, conspiracy theories, and well that's not exactly true because we're going to talk about the greatest conspiracy theory of all time. And it started way back almost in the beginning in the Garden of Eden in Genesis 3 and verses 4 and 5 when the devil said, surely you will not die when he was talking to Eve about eating the fruit that she wasn't supposed to touch in the middle of the garden. He said, surely you will not die, for God knows that when you eat it, you'll know good and evil. So that was the first conspiracy theory, really. I mean, that was it. The devil said, your eyes will be opened. You'll know good and evil. You'll be like God. So let's just take a minute and pray as we do this service. Heavenly Father, I pray today that uh, every word that comes out of my mouth, Lord, it, it edifies you, it exalts you, that you be glorified and lifted high. And Lord, we are your children, and, and we know that you love us. And sometimes you have to correct us, sometimes you encourage us, but you always love us. We just thank you, Jesus, for always being here for us. We thank you, Jesus, that... Uh, for all those who are confused, perplexed, for hurting people, that for those who find themselves in chaos, that uh, Lord, even though they're afraid of what's going on in this world, as we all have concerns, that Father God, I pray as you taught us, Jesus. our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who have sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And this week again, um, I had visits from people who were upset and, and just needed someone to talk to. Uh, again, facing possible job loss, facing possibly making a choice they don't want to make, but they don't think they have an alternative. It's a tough life out there, and, and I couldn't solve all their problems, and I, I never will be able to solve all the problems. But I can show them and talk to them about a bigger problem, and that's sin. The sin in their life, the sin that separates them from death, the sin in my life, because I'm not exempt and I'm certainly not perfect, I tell you that all the time. But a sin that can drag them to hell, which is even worse than the, what we see as the alternatives right here. And in Romans in chapter 6 and verse 23, it says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Yet God, in His grace, freely, freely, makes us right in His sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when He freed us from the penalty of our sin. When Christ died on that cross, for God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. When He took our place on that cross, sacrifice for my sin, sacrifice for your sin, for our sin, 
for everyone. And just as we've all sinned, there is hope for us all. And that hope is in Jesus. Jesus who chose to die on that cross. Remember, he didn't have to. He chose to stay there. He could have got down. He said he could have called a legion of angels. Six legions. 72,000 angels he could have called. But he chose there. And some of you in, in the room will have heard the short uh, little story I'm going to tell you about sin. If we're watching later, it may be new to you. But I'll ask you, have you ever stole something, big or small? I have, and over the years, I've had my share of sin. I was only probably four or five. We were visiting friends in Elliott Lake. Mom had uh, given my older brother Rob a bit of change to go to the store and buy some candy. Remember the days when you could get three black balls for a penny and you had tubes and all that kind of stuff and it was all bulk? Well, I guess I didn't like what Rob chose. So when no one was looking, this sweet, innocent little guy just helped himself to some and just thought, you know what, I'll just get the kind I like. So I tucked a handful of candy, I guess, in my pants or my jacket. And on the walk home, I started eating it. And that didn't go over too well. That didn't go over. Rob saw me, and uh, he wasn't happy. So he marched me back to the store. And I remember being so scared of the man at the store. I was only little, so he towered over me. It was like he was huge. And I remember him towering there, and he was grouchy looking and mean. And he, of course, he had a right to be. I had stolen his candy. But I was a thief. And he had a big dog, I remember a big German Shepherd dog that was sitting there in the store. In those days, health rules weren't the same that they are now, right? So, but I gave the man back his candy, and I was shaking, and I said I was sorry. But what I didn't know until much later was that the guy gave Rob the candy. Like, he gave my brother the candy that I had stolen because he couldn't sell it again, so he gave it to Rob for bringing me back. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I got triple whammy because I got in trouble three times. I got in trouble from Rob first. He marches me back to the store and I get in trouble from the store. Well, then when we got back to where we were standing and then Mom gave it to me, it was like the worst. So, and Rob got me the candy. So, I deserved the punishment. Have I forgiven him for that? <laughs> I deserved the punishment I got. I did the crime, so I had to do the time. So, yeah, it's, it's, that would, okay. For well, those watching later, won't have seen it. So, the, so this week I was able to be the sounding board, but I was also able to share the gospel, which was kind of cool. Because one guy, one guy came and said, you know, and he said, can I talk to you for a few minutes? Well, it was three and some hours later. We're still talking, so it was an opportunity to be able to know that we could talk about the cross. And today when we think about the thief on that cross, we didn't know who he was. We don't know why he was there. We don't know how old he was. We don't know what he did to get himself into that spot. We know that he must have ended up in a Roman jail before he got to the cross. And on that cross, it was his execution day. It was his crucifixion day. But the Bible tells us that he deserved it. And that he wasn't alone. That on that cross, there were two others beside him. One a thief, and one Jesus. The Jewish rabbi, the Messiah, our Savior, hanging on the cross. The crucifixion's a horrible death. Hours and hours of agonizing pain. All of your weight crushing, crushing your chest, because you're held there and you're, you're just holding yourself, holding yourself. So every last ounce of your own body is suffocating you. And yet, as disgusting as that may sound, as horrible as it sounds, a crowd came to watch. People came to watch, to watch death, even death on a cross. They came to yell insults. They came to mock Jesus. People came to see death, painful, agonizing death. And when we see pictures 
of the cross, and we see the three crosses on a hill, we, they always look, they, they depict them as they're up high. Well, the crosses weren't up high. Remember, the Bible tells us in reality they were down low because they could spit in Jesus' face. So that cross wasn't up high like you see it in the pictures. It was down where he could hear and see everything that was going on and know. They pierced his side, mocked him, spit on him, and he didn't fight back. He didn't get down. They say, if you were king, if you're king of the Jews, show yourself, save yourself. And even the thieves on the cross were mocking him at first. In Matthew uh, 27 and 44, it says, in the same way the thieves threw insults or hurled insults at him. The rebels who were crucified also heaped insults on them. Everyone there, the rulers, the soldiers, the crowd mocking, and some crying, they could see the pain, the anguish, the torture. Yet, then in the midst of the humiliation, the pain, the disgrace, there's a change of tone in the second thief's words. The first thief yelled, Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself if you're the king. Save yourself and save us. But then the second thief, he has a change of heart. And he says to the other, he says, Don't you fear God, since you're under the same sentence of death? Now, we don't know what it was or how this thief came to believe that Jesus was the Messiah, the Savior. Could have been the, the sign above the cross that said Jesus, King of the Jews. It could have been. Could have been what they heard. Or maybe it was that Jesus didn't react and didn't get mad. But what we do know is that he believed. He said, Don't you fear God? Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered, Truly, tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. And that passage is a wonderful image of how Jesus Christ saves. Our salvation is by grace, through faith, without works. In Luke uh, chapter 23 and verse 43 it says, truly, truly, I tell you, today you'll be with me in paradise, in heaven in glory. The thief had no works. He couldn't offer anything that he had done, either before or after being on the cross. What do we know about this man? He's hanging on a cross. He's wasted his life away. That's how he ended up in jail. He must have done something. He's hanging there, and not just in judgment of God, but judgment of all the people who stood around that cross and watched that terrible crucifixion. He's hanging there with no hope. What would you guys do? What would we do? Those that are watching, what would you tell him this morning? What would you say to him, to the thief on the cross? He couldn't join a church. He couldn't be baptized. He couldn't take out membership. He couldn't do any good works. Obviously, he probably hadn't done a lot of good works. He couldn't buy anyone clothes. He couldn't supply food or anything for the poor. He couldn't feed the hungry. So this man, on that cross, in the eyes of even some of religions and churches today, was without hope. Why? Because there was nothing he could do on his own. Because he was incapacitated, he was nailed to the cross, but that's the essence of salvation. That's the truth of salvation. Is that there's nothing, nothing you can do to earn it. Even if you could do something of, your, of yourself, by yourself, for yourself, it's really useless because you can't get to heaven by works. You can't buy salvation. You just can't be saved by your works. Ephesians 2 and 8 says, God saved you by His grace when you first believed. Salvation is not a reward for good things we've done. 
It says, so none of us can boast. I tell you, you may try your whole life and you'll fail to earn salvation. Jesus said, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Can you imagine the freedom that that thief had? Can you imagine? Think back to the freedom of when we gave our lives to Christ to be able to be free from the sin that we had had. The joy, the freedom. You know, I can almost see the pain in his face. Feel his pain, the anguish, the torture. Yet then, in the midst of the humiliation, the disgrace, literally, literally with probably mere minutes left, the thief receives salvation, eternal life. And Jesus says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The ultimate in grace is bestowed upon the undeserving, just as it was upon me. I certainly didn't deserve it. But with the thief on the cross with minutes to live, suffering excruciating pain and barely able to breathe, he comes to know Jesus. And Jesus forgives those who are crucifying him. He doesn't call down a bowl of lightning, meek and mild, without so much as a whisper of revenge. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That's forgiveness. Yeah. In a flash, in an instant, the thief realized that Jesus was Lord. <coughs> no one unless sent from God, no one can forgive like that. No one except God himself. The thief recognized the king of kings, yet not because of anything he had done. Nothing. There was nothing. It was actually in spite of what he had done. Because the thief didn't have a chance to repent and turn and show any other side of him. He didn't have time to live a righteous life. All he could do was plead for grace and mercy. Grace unearned, grace undeserved, unmerited. Grace without condemnation. For the Bible tells us there's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Grace like no one else had ever seen before. Grace that they didn't understand. Matthew 9 and 13 sums it up. It says, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Luke chapter 5 and verse 31 says, Jesus answered them, Healthy people do not need a doctor. Sick people do. Jesus' love is not based on our circumstances. No, it's forgiveness. What if Jesus loves you? Even when we don't show him love. What we're going through isn't something local. In 1 Peter chapter 5, and verse 7, actually go back to verse 6. Actually, go back to verse 5. You younger men, likewise be subject to your elders, and all of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. For God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxiety upon him, because he cares for you. Be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. But resist him in your faith, knowing that the same experience of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are around the world. And after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be dominion forever and ever. Amen. We're not, certainly not the only ones going through this crazy, crazy, crazy time. But today, especially if you're watching, you can, today you can celebrate a new beginning. To celebrate with us that Jesus willingly went to that cross. That Jesus chose 
to go to that cross, chose to stay and die, an absolutely horrible, demeaning death on a cross so that we and our friends and our family have an opportunity to be able to have that salvation. That we can share that good news. Jesus chose to die for me, for you, for us, for everyone who chooses to call on the Lord. For all of us who surrender to Jesus, he died for us. Nothing we could do could earn that freedom. Nothing we could say, no grace, no mercy, other than Jesus. A free gift bestowed upon us, not because we deserved it, but because he loves us. Undeserved grace, undeserved mercy, unearned grace, unearned mercy. Mercy showing us that in my human nature, I can't certainly understand. I can't wrap my head around it. How God, how anyone, could forgive everyone and give them a new start. In Matthew, in chapter 26, in verses 26 to 28, it says that while they were, while they were eating, Jesus took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, said, take and eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink from it. Drink from all of you. This is my blood, my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus rewrote history. He redefined history. He, Jesus fulfilled the prophecies. This was the shift from law to grace. The whole earth seemed to respond. For three hours during the day, from 12 to 3, darkness came upon the earth. Darkness came upon the earth from noon to 3. It tells us the veil of the temple was torn, was wrought from top to bottom. The earth shook. The rocks were split. In those days, the temple veil hung as a divider. It divided the people from God's presence. They weren't allowed to go beyond that veil. They weren't allowed into that to be able to be because they believed in their culture that God inhabited that other side. Well, we know that God inhabits everywhere. So until that day, a commoner couldn't come into God's presence. But now Jesus paid the price, and all could come directly to God in repentance. The crucifixion, the crucifixion had been prophesied, it had been spoken about. It was no surprise to Jesus. He knew this was coming. In Psalm 22, and verses 17, it says, all of my bones are on display. People have come, they stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes and cast lots for them. In Zechariah in chapter 11 and verse 12, it says, I told them, if you think it is best, give me my pay. But if not, keep it. So they paid me 30 pieces of silver. The price of a common slave. 30 pieces that Judas Iscariot later took. And when he felt remorse, he took it back and he threw it into the temple and said, I've sinned. This guy hadn't done anything wrong. And they laughed at him. He said, You put that to us, you did it, you brought it upon yourself. Not a bone was broken. And that was prophesied back in Numbers. That not a bone, the death would be there, but not a bone was broken. When they pierced his side, nothing was broken. There were no surprises to Jesus. It's all part of the Master's plan. Today, I ask you to think about it. Think. What do you really think about Jesus accepting the thief on the cross, 
and giving him instantaneous salvation. Right there in the spot. Mm -hmm. Even though he couldn't change his life, he couldn't change his past, that thief saw heaven that day. <coughs> I remind you that we have friends, family, neighbors, that think that they've done too much. They think they're too bad. Their sin is worse than anybody else's. They think that God could never love them. But we know that God does love them. They think they're not worthy. They're not forgivable. But God knows what they did, what they've done, what they're doing. Yeah. And they can be there and say, God, you can't love me. I'm an addict. I'm a thief. I'm a drug dealer. I'm an adulterer. But he knows. Because God knows. He knows it all. Just like he knew I was a sinner and he knew what I had to get rid of. Yet still he loved me. Even before I had given up any of the things, he still loved me. God loves us just the way we are. And we have friends and neighbors that need to hear that. Loved ones that we need to make sure that we have that opportunity and take the opportunity to say, just come as you are. God will take off those rough spots. Don't wait until you get clean. Don't wait until you're stopped. Because perfection is not something to be attained. Come now and let Jesus into your heart. Jesus, yeah, he'll, he'll rough off the, the rough spots. He'll take them, buff them away. He'll shine your halo. I remember as a kid, my grandmother had a friend, Mrs. Gruff, who would all say, Oh, Teddy, you're an angel. We just need to shine your halo a little bit. So... It needed a lot. It was pretty tarnished back then. It's still tarnished, but not as much as it was then. God will take care of the rest. Simple? Perhaps too simple? Maybe that's why Jesus said, come as little children with childlike faith, with childlike trust. So today, if you're watching, I invite you, if you've never asked Jesus into your heart, to be your Lord and Savior, I invite you right now just to re just repeat a simple prayer with us. Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I am a sinner and I ask your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I turn from my sin. I repent of my sinful ways. I invite you, Jesus, into my heart and my life. I want to trust you, Jesus, and follow you as my Lord and Savior. In your precious name, amen. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Heavenly Father, we just ask that you continue to give us the strength and the courage to be able to witness to our loved ones and our friends and help us to be able to know that you loved us, still do, however we are, however we come to you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Amen.